This video has been sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. It's a service where you have instantaneous access to lectures by top professors. One of these lectures inspired the creation of this video, so stay tuned till the end of the video to find out more. On October 4th, 1957, the Soviets launched the first man-made satellite into orbit, called Sputnik 1. It was an odd little device, weighing about as much as an adult man. This metal sphere had the pretty simple task of transmitting radio signals from orbit. Remember, this was the height of the Cold War, and having a Soviet device orbiting above the United States made the public wary, and the government a little nervous. After all, while the technology was just used to send a satellite into space, it could also be used to send a nuke to America. Many saw it as a definitive show of the Soviets' technological prowess over America, and Eisenhower took this challenge to heart. Some saw America as losing its position in the world, now lagging behind the communists. This would be the event to start the space race between two nations. The Soviets quickly followed this up with Sputnik 2 the next month, which carried the first living thing to orbit. She was a dog. Her name was Laika. This obviously didn't help the American self-esteem, but the U.S. had something in the works. In January 1958, America launched its own satellite into orbit, Explorer 1. A momentous achievement for sure, but the U.S. was still number two in the space race, and it wouldn't be long until the U.S. passed the National Aeronautics and Space Act. This formed NASA, giving the nation a devoted agency for space exploration. As the Americans tried to find their footing, the Soviets were taking great advantage over their lead. Soon the Americans feared they could be close to something bigger. Those fears were confirmed in April 1961, when the Soviets sent Yuri Gagarin into space. The prior achievements have been notable, but this was more concrete. The only man to ever leave Earth was a Soviet. A month later, the Americans had their own man to send, Alan Shepard. Both men were honored as heroes in their nations and around the world. Before this, President Kennedy was not a fan of space exploration in the least. He saw it as expensive and certainly not in the best interest of the nation. As he saw the response of the Soviets and the Americans to Gagarin's journey, he knew action was needed. At this point, he met with NASA's director, Werner von Braun. Yes, he went from Nazi rocketeer to NASA in just two decades. We have a video on that. There was a couple options considered, but the one they went with had a good mix of realism and fantasy to send a man to the moon. With that, JFK met with Congress and earned funding for this massive endeavor. They give NASA considerable funding to begin new programs such as the Mercury program, which allowed John Glenn to orbit the Earth. Going forward, the Americans launched Project Gemini, now allowing two astronauts aboard a craft instead of one. The Soviets had a man that completed a spacewalk. Both nations had good amounts of achievements, but I know all you care about is getting to the moon. Unlike the Soviets, the Americans were entirely focused on the goal of reaching the moon since the start of the 1960s. The culmination of this was the Apollo program. The first mission failed terribly. Three astronauts were killed when the command module caught fire. After these issues were figured out, the final issue of reaching the moon was power. They needed an amazing rocket that had not been created yet. Under the direction of Von Braun, NASA developed the Saturn V. The Soviets, they had the N1L3. It was close to the size of the Saturn V and was also intended to carry men to the moon. Leading the Soviet space program was Korolev, again from our previous video. By 1966, he had died and the mission's progress stalled. The intention was to carry two men to the moon. Obviously, this never came to fruition. On the American side, the Apollo missions were turning out to be a grand success. In December 1968, three astronauts were sent around the moon and back to the Earth. They took the picture that some argue inspired contemporary environmentalism and showed just how close we were to reaching the moon. Less than a year later, on July 20th, 1969, NASA did it. You all know the story. Apollo 11 sent Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin to the moon. Michael Collins, the third member of the team, orbited it while they walked on its surface. It was viewed by a fifth of the world. Everybody came together in awe, and you know the rest. After this, support for space missions waned, and the Apollo missions ended in 1972, when the final men walked on the moon. The Soviets were faced with a bit more setbacks than the Americans. Just weeks before the American moon landing, the Soviets suffered a major explosion in their N1 rocket. It just wasn't stable enough to carry men to the moon. After this failure, and the Americans actually reached the moon, support by the Soviets dropped to continue this goal altogether. 
After all, the most they could ever be is the second nation to reach the moon. Overall, the Soviets had just suffered too many issues with the rocket they were using. Building a new one and going even further would be too much of an ambitious and expensive project. Too risky. Instead, they tried for another achievement. A space station. They were successful sending up their Salyut 1 up to low orbit in 1971. Two years later, the Americans followed up with Skylab, its own station, but the race was basically over. Nixon had no interest in continuing anything other than the space shuttle program, and in 1975, the Americans and Soviets took the chance to end the space race for good. This was the Apollo-Soyuz test, a joint project between both nations. Both an Apollo and Soyuz craft docked together, and the two groups exchanged gifts. So there you have it. The story of two nations fighting it out for scientific achievement. A positive effect of the Cold War. While the budget drained afterwards and public support fell once America had a good old pat on the back, it's still one of, if not the single, greatest achievement in human history. Either way, here's hoping we find ourselves back on the moon someday. Or maybe even something more ambitious. This video was inspired by a lecture which was featured in the video service The Great Courses Plus. 1969 Walking on the Moon, taught by Professor Vejas Gabriel Lulivicius. Here he detailed the history and journey of getting to the moon. You can access this and many numerous courses through The Great Courses Plus. It's a subscription on-demand video learning service with over 7,000 video lectures taught by professors in basically every field. Topics like science, history, math, and even really specific and odd topics that continue to always be updated like photography. Courses are sometimes even hosted by National Geographic and the Smithsonian. I don't like college, mostly because of the grades, so this is pretty much that. Remove the pressure of failure, just watch and listen. If you want to learn more about space, click on this link to get one month of unlimited access to courses and videos absolutely free. Just visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash knowledge. The link is provided in the description below. This is Cody of Knowledge Hub.